1994, the mid 90s. It was a great time for cinema. The Mask, Speed, Interview with the Vampire, just to name a few. What was also amazing were the black and white films you could buy at that time. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of TOC Extra. I'm your host, Azrael Knight, and today I'm going to go over the top 10 hottest 35 millimeter black and white films you could buy in 1994. Something I want to mention about this list before I get started. This isn't a list of films released in 1994. It's a list of films available in 1994. I constructed this from an article published in the October 1994 issue of Peterson's Photographic. Of course, I didn't just copy and paste it. I spent a good amount of time going through other magazines between 1986 and 1998 to get a clear picture of each film. The article didn't have the films in any particular order either, so I googled each of them to put them in order based on how many results came up. Pretty simple. Be sure and stay tuned until the end of the video to learn more about my research techniques. With that being said, let's get started. Number 10, Agfa Agfapan APX25. Starting off our list is the now discontinued Agfapan APX25, a super sharp film with extremely fine grain. APX25 has a surprisingly good exposure latitude for its speed. Even though you can't buy this film new anymore, I had the opportunity to shoot with some that was frozen since new. I used a baby Graflex and did some skyline photography, and if you want to see that episode, I'll leave a link in the description. But I can definitely agree that it's very sharp and renders images beautifully. This review, written by outdoor photographer contributor John Denny Ashley, claims that a 35mm looks just as good as a 6x7 and a medium format is as good as a 4x5. With my Pentax 67 and the 120 Agvapan 25 APX, I can get 4x5 quality enlargements at 16x20 and larger that exhibit no grain. With an 11x14, you can hardly tell the difference between a print from 35mm and one from 120. If you manage to get some cold stored APX25 for yourself, it's recommended you develop with Rodinol with a high dilution such as 1 plus 50, 1 plus 75, or even 1 plus 100. Number nine, Agfa Agfapan APX100. Taking the number 9 spot is the 100 speed version of Agvapan APX. Described in Peterson's Photographic Magazine as not as fine grained or sharp as Kodak T-Max, but it has a strong following due to its tonal range and smooth characteristic curve. APX 100 was recommended for use when tones were of great importance, such as portraits or fashion photography. In my early years of shooting film, I loved APX 100 and used it often. Though I fell out of favor for it due to the film's extreme curl, I'd often be fighting to get it on my scanner. Agfapan APX 100 is still available as of 2021, and you can grab yourself a roll in stores like B&H for 689 USD. Number eight, Fuji Neopan 1600. Coming in at number 8 is the High Speed Neopan 1600, introduced in 1989 and discontinued in 2010. Neopan 1600 was the fastest black and white film until the release of Kodak P3200. Neopan was known for retaining shadow detail as well as highlights so less dodging and burning was required in the darkroom. David Brooks, Peterson's Photographic Magazine contributor, did an extensive field test while in Sweden and published his findings in June 1989. When tabular grain technology was originally incorporated into black and white film, the results were nothing short of extraordinary, says Brooks. Not only can Neopan 1600 be processed at the same short times used by ISO 400 films, but it will exhibit image quality far superior to that of any ISO 400 film pushed to 1600. You can see here in these examples from Brooks, the film is quite lovely. As stated, Neopan 1600 is a discontinued film. The only Neopan film to survive into the 20s seems to be Neopan Acros 100, and even then production stopped before there was an outcry and a second version of the film was introduced shortly after. I do have a roll of Neopan 1600 preserved in cold storage, but I have yet to try it. Number 7, Kodak Technical Pen. 
At number seven is the strange and oddly two-faced Kodak Technical Pan. Technical Pan film, at least in the early 90s, was the sharpest, finest grain film available in 35 millimeter. Technical Pan, or Tech Pan for short, was really a scientific film, according to this article titled 10 Weird Films in Peterson's Photographic, published in May 1990. According to this review published in November that year, it was great for aerial photography because its extended red sensitivity and inherent high contrast add snap. TechPan has two excellent uses, producing high contrast images with no midtones and producing continuous tone images that can be enlarged greatly with excellent image quality. These two photos showcase just how extremely bipolar TechPan is. On the left is TechPan developed with Kodak D19 and printed on a high contrast paper. On the right is a more normal development with full tonal range. For high contrast effects, develop the film in Kodak D19 as per the film instruction sheet and print the resulting negatives on high contrast paper. For continuous tone images, rate the film at EI25 and develop it in Kodak Technodol or Perfection XR2 developer. I happen to have a few rolls of tech pen and cold storage donated to me, and I shot one at the beginning of the year with some very nice results. As you can see, I went with a more conservative development and I love what I got. I'll leave a link to that episode in the description. I'm looking forward to trying it in medium format when the time is right, and I also happen to have some D19, so maybe I'll try to reproduce those extreme high contrast results at some point. My guess is because it was used for technical purposes, it was replaced by digital photography, and being discontinued in 2004 seems to lend to that theory. Number 6, Kodak T-Max P3200. Popping in at number six is T-Max P3200 by Kodak. P3200 is a surprisingly diverse film that can be exposed as low as 800 or as high as 50,000 ISO according to Peterson's Photographic, though they admit this would be for surveillance purposes only. I had a look through the massive dev chart to see if I could find a developing time for that speed, but the highest I saw was 25,000 with XTOL. I'd be curious to know what they used. Uh, I didn't check every developer, just the ones that I had, so let me know which one I missed. I haven't used P3200 often, only a couple of times, but my last experience was a good one. Last year I shot with it and produced one of my top 10 favorite black and white photos of 2020, and it became part of my box set. I'll leave a link to that episode in the description. As stated in this review, when the light is low, Kodak's T-Max P3200 film really shines. Long story short, if you like grain, then you'll love P3200. Introduced in 1988 and still available today, P3200 was a massive leap forward for photography and was considered the natural replacement for Kodak recording film, producing photos of significantly finer grain and greater sharpness at a faster speed. P3200 is not a cheap film, costing you about $12.74 a roll. Uh, the P, by the way, stands for push, as that is one of its principal qualities. Number five, Ilford XP2 400. Hitting the halfway mark is the unusual XP2 400 by Ilford. In the strictest sense, XP2 isn't a traditional black and white film, as it's a C41 processed film. The image in the negative is produced with dye rather than metallic silver. There are, however, a couple of advantages to that. The main advantage that Ilford wanted to give its customers with XP2 was the ability to have their black and white negatives developed at a one hour lab. XP2400 replaced XP1, as mentioned in this April 1991 review in Peterson's Photographic, introducing three new films by Ilford. Here it is referred to as a chromogenic black and white. The XP films produce black and white dye images after processing in standard C41 color negative chemicals, states Mike Stenswold. This difference has several significant benefits for the photographer. The first of those I mentioned already, being able to take it to a one hour photo, the second Stensvold mentions is that there is virtually no grain, and the third is being able to produce usable images exposing frames anywhere from 50 to 800 EI in a single roll. 
basically you can underexpose by two stops and overexpose by one and still have a workable image, though the best results are from a proper exposure of course. XP2400 would be replaced in 1996 by XP2 Plus, then eventually XP2 Super, which is still available today. In fact, you can find it in some drugstores. Buying a roll at B&H will cost you about 1123 USD, so if you're developing film at home, it's actually more cost effective to use traditional black and white film and chemicals. Number four and number three, Kodak T-Max 100 and 400. At numbers 4 and 3 are Kodak's T-Max 100 and 400 respectively. I paired these up to talk about them at the same time because they were released at the same time. Europeans were privy to using T-Max starting in October 1986, while the rest of the world had to wait until January 1987. A lot of mystery was shrouded around these two films before their release. Several photography magazines were mailed film for review with no official name. In at least one case, they had the designations XO382 for T-Max 400 and XO267 for T-Max 100, so a review could be ready before the initial announcement. Another reviewer mentioned they had designations, but didn't mention the specific numbers. Perhaps they were all labeled 382 and 267, Maybe each mailout had its own number for tracing purposes. I can't be sure, but what I do know from my research is that rumors spread for at least six months before the announcement that Kodak was cooking up something. In this review published in November 1986 by Modern Photography, Peter Krauss compares T-Max 400 to Tri-X and T-Max 100 to Plus X because they were considered to be the natural successors. It's interesting to think about now, but at the time, reviewers speculated that T-Max would be replacing these films. It's clear that the new emulsion technology gives both new films a big boost in the all-important speed-grain sharpness balance, says Krauss. Here's Tri-X compared to T-Max 400. And Plus X next to T-Max 100. Ultimately, it's the individual who will decide which film is better for themselves. And of course, as you may know, Tri-X didn't go anywhere and Plus X wasn't discontinued until 2011. That being said, T-Max 100 and 400, like P3200 mentioned earlier, was an amazing leap forward for film technology, utilizing T-grain structure. If you want to learn more about tabular grain, check out my video on the history of Kodacolor VR film. I've also done several videos using T-Max, and I'll leave a link for those as well. Scott Griswold Jr. of Peterson's Photographic did a fantastic review of T-Max on one of those early unmarked rolls in late 1986. Griswold did a very careful ISO test to ensure the perfect exposure with his equipment and took these. As mentioned, T-Max is still available today, and you'll pay about 919 USD for the 400 speed and 995 for the 100 speed. Number two, Ilford Delta 400. Sliding into the number two spot and grabbing the silver for today's list is what would be the direct competitor for Kodak's T-Max 400. Ilford Delta 400. Delta 400 was introduced in 1991, and in this review by Peter Colonia in Popular Photography's May 1992 issue, we learn why it's called Delta. The Greek letter Delta is a triangle, and like a triangle, the silver highlight crystals of Delta film are three-sided, or more precisely, three-layered. Ilford described Delta's emulsion as based on core shell technology, so-called because the crystal shell, a two-sided layer of silver bromide and silver iodide crystals, surrounds a central core of primarily silver iodide. Delta 400 utilizes a single layer emulsion to reduce light scattering, thus creating greater resolving power. Another advantage over T-Max 400 was the lack of pink stain. Kodak uses a magenta sensitizing dye that results in a sometimes pink negative as well as fixer that exhausts quicker than conventional films. Ilford Delta 400 won the European Black and White Film of the Year Award for 1991-92 and was selected as the film most likely to be appreciated by both amateur and professional photographers. 
I've used Delta 400 in several videos and I'll leave a link for those in the description. Still available today, Delta 400 is available at B&H for $9.99 USD. Before I get to the number one spot, here are a couple of honorable mentions. Number 1. Ilford Delta 100 Obtaining the gold, the highest honor on today's list of hottest black and white films that you could buy in 1994 is Ilford Delta 100. Delta 100 was released in 1993. According to Peterson's photographic, it has exceptionally fine grain for the speed, tremendous sharpness, excellent exposure latitude, and great development latitude in all popular black and white developers. This full page ad I found in the August 1993 issue of Photolife magazine says Delta 100 is the world's sharpest film. A bold claim for sure, even if it comes with this little caveat. Almost as bold as the statement at the bottom. We are black and white. They aren't wrong though. Ilford has been an amazing beacon of light in the darkest of times for film photography. Today, in late 2021, Ilford offers nine different black and white films in 35mm format. Just like its older brother Delta 400, Delta 100 claimed the achievement of European Black and White Film of the Year for 1993-94 and utilizes all the same three-layer grain technology. The best film doesn't come with the best price though at a rather steep 1123 USD. And that is the end of today's list. Do you agree with the order? Is there a film that should have been included? Let me know in the comments. Making videos like this is a lot of fun, but it's not easy. I've spent the last few years accumulating a massive physical collection of almost 1,000 issues of 22 different photography magazines, then painstakingly indexing each one for every camera, lens, film, flash, or piece of darkroom equipment mentioned. And after hundreds of hours indexing my collection, it's still only 28% cataloged. When it's time to create an episode, I can then use a search function to find the articles, ads, and reviews needed faster. But I still need to scan each piece. 90% of what you saw here today was not previously available online. So if you enjoy these videos, please consider joining me on Patreon. Perks include early access, free prints, and more. Go to patreon.com slash Azrael to subscribe. Also sharing this video, regardless of how strong your social media following is, boosts the algorithm. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And until next time, stay classic.